Good morning, everyone. So today we have a special session because it's a workshop, a, a workshop where you can actually talk to our experts. And we want to do that because the climate change challenge is live now, where we are expecting uh, entries from the schools. And before we get into the workshop today, we will recap first all the discussions that we have had in climate change challenge. We will see what climate change means, what are the different things that we can all do about fighting climate change. So climate change is caused because of heat that is trapped in Earth's atmosphere. And who is trapping this heat? It's being trapped by different molecules, which we call as greenhouse gases. CO2, water molecules, methane are all greenhouse gases. However, CO2 stays for a very, very long time. And hence, we think that CO2 or carbon dioxide is the biggest contributor to the climate change. Now, CO2 is in our atmosphere since a very, very long time. Then why are we concerned about now? Because in the last one century, due to industrialization, there has been an unprecedented increase in the amount of CO2 amount of CO2 in our atmosphere. And because of this enormous increase in the amount of CO2, there's a lot of heat that is being accumulated in the atmosphere, which is causing the climate change. What is it causing this unprecedented amount of increase in CO2? Industrialization is supposed to be the biggest reason behind this. And of course, our lifestyle that has been impacted due to industrialization also is a huge cause for the climate change. And what happens because of climate change? As the name suggests, the climate changes, which means the summer gets more hotter, the winter gets more colder, there are more floods. And so people all across the world are facing the wrath of climate change. So, and the, the worst affected are the ones who live in the more fragile ecosystems. Those could be the coastal regions, the islands, the mountains, the pastures. And we have discussed, for example, in a, one of our earlier sessions, how people in Lakshadweep are getting affected. And you might have looked into our comics where we talk about how people in Sundarbans are getting affected or in Himalayas, uh, they're losing their ice caps and hence their livelihoods, which actually depended on the fishing or uh, the roots of the shepherds uh, are all affected due to the climate change. And because their livelihoods are affected, then people have to also migrate out of their uh, own places. And what happens because of this migration is that they... Okay, we have somebody. Yeah. So because of this migration, people also live a more, um, a poorer life. Not just in terms of money, but also in the quality of their life. So, and and of course, many things are required to to make this better. And one can always say that we need better policies. Government needs to come in to make things better. And there is no denying to any of this. On the other hand, there are also many things where you and I and all of us can also be involved in causing a problem and also become change makers and make things better. So, so uh, in one of our, in the last session, for example, we discussed how uh, simple things like uh, the textile industry or how much of consumption we are doing in terms of clothes or in terms of any other commodity that could be food, uh, that could be anything that you're buying. I mean, so one thing is you buy because you need it and which is necessary. I mean, we are, we, we are constantly trying to improve our lives and lifestyles. But on the other hand, there's also a thing called as overconsumption. And there's a very thin line probably between consumption and overconsumption. So while we need consumption because we want to live a better and happier life, we probably want to cut down on the overconsumption because anything that we are using, be it the clothes that you're wearing or the food that we are buying, there's, there's a carbon footprint to it. What it means is, you might all remember from our discussions that carbon footprint is nothing but the amount of CO2 that has been released into the atmosphere because of the thing, because of the production of that thing. So we do want to reduce our carbon footprint and 
we want to do it on the as big a scale as we can so that scale can be our family that scale can be our community our school our city our country and the globe as well and there are many different ways of doing this to begin with we we need to educate people we need to tell them that there is climate change happening how are people across the world getting affected due to it because people like us who are in cities probably do not get to see the impact of climate change yet in our lives in a in a drastic way but there are others who are living in more fragile places where they are seeing this impact and maybe because we have access to this information the onus is also on us to spread this information and then and of course press for better policies we need to work on science and research to understand the problem also in its entirety or as much as we can and based on the knowledge that we get about the crisis we need to design technologies that can technologies can help in different ways it can either help in reducing the climate change or avoiding the climate change or reducing the pace of climate change mainly or even make i mean make it easier to endure the impact of climate change for example if we know that okay floods are happening then can we have a technology because of which uh, people who live on the coasts can can survive it better that's only an example so and that is i mean keeping all of these in the heart we have designed the climate change challenge for all of you where i'm hoping that you have taken a look at the kind of questions that we have asked in climate change you would see that there are four categories we have art we have games we have research and we have technology so through art we want that you come up with art in any form it could be a drawing it could be a photograph it could be a audio file a video file anything but but the only thing that we expect is that art should help us in raising conversations around climate change again you can also be sending us designs of games and i must say like i went through some of the entries that we have already gotten and uh, i see designs of cricket or football we are not looking for designs for any game but we are looking for designs of games which can talk about climate change so the game design has to come across in a way that when somebody plays this game they'll understand what is causing climate change what what happens in climate change so design a new game that can help our friends understand climate change better friends who might not have attended these sessions in the last two months and if they have to understand climate change then your game should be able to do that then we have research because we do not yet understand completely how climate change is impacting our own local surroundings like i live in hyderabad and in my community if you ask me i still don't know what really is happening because of climate change to people around me so can i find out through research what is happening to people around me or can i find out what is happening to the air quality in hyderabad because i live in hyderabad and you could be living in any part of india and the same questions can hold true for you and what's happening to the people around here there's a lot of for example migrant population Uh, around the place where i stay what is happening to them uh, because of the climate crisis are they in hyderabad because they come from a place which is impacted by climate crisis and these kinds of questions are enormous there are numerous and there's no dearth of it we need to just find out identify what is the right question that we want to ask and then of course technology like i have already mentioned technology which will which you i mean once you have figured out what is the main problem or what are some of the main problems that climate crisis is causing in your surroundings in your cities or towns then what kind of a technology would you require to make the lives of those people better so that you can improve their lives by reducing the the carbon footprint of the community in itself by reducing the uh, greenhouse gas emission which is co2 emission or you can develop technologies which will make lives of people better in the face of climate change if there have to have i mean if there will be floods we know that there are floods happening or there are cyclones happening or there are droughts happening then what can we do to make lives of these people better so this is what our workshop is going to focus on today you all i'm hoping have already 
come here with some thoughts of what you want to work on if not we will help you identify or help you get um, oriented towards how you can identify them and start thinking of how your solution is going to impact lives of people around you and for that we have dr sudhira with us sudhira is the director of gubi labs gubi labs is a science communication initiative science communication means connecting science with people so it's not like science is only for the scientists science is for everyone and that's what the efforts of science communication does and gubi labs in india does an enormous initiative if you have not taken a look at their website you should do that and sudhira comes in with a very very interesting blend of experience sudhira and has studied and understands well how cities develop and what kinds of issues can also come up due to expansion of cities and that i think is very interesting and very apt in our discussion today because a lot of us are actually city dwellers in this workshop and we need to understand the structure of cities uh, to to understand how climate crisis might be impacting that and in addition sudhira of course understands a little uh the science and technology aspects much better than many of us and uh, with that sudhira i'll take i mean the floor is yours and you can start with your workshop yeah thank you sondata uh it's very nice um i'm really glad to be here thank you for the invitation and and the introduction there sudhira uh, could you be just a little louder yeah sure thank yeah. you uh sundata uh for the nice introduction and thank you for having me here and i'm glad to be uh taking this uh, session today so uh before i start uh i just maybe pull out my slides for the day so as uh, sundata was suggest uh, indicating right so what i will be doing today is i will be uh hopefully taking you to look at how do we go about doing research uh in the sense uh, essentially from the perspective of climate change trying to understand uh, uh how how do we seek uh, answers or in more than that also frame questions around it uh, i have a slide uh, typically i use uh, i mean I'm a big fan of calvin and hobbes i'm sure many of you may know of it uh this is a strip uh, by bill watterson um, so calvin um is with his imaginary tiger friend hobbs and is asking why like hobbs is asking him why are you digging a hole he says i'm looking for buried treasure he says what have you found he says a few dirty rocks a weird root and some disgusting grubs so he says on your first try he says yeah as in there's treasure everywhere isn't that so apt here because when it comes to research and science at large or even in, in at look at social sciences or so there is so much uh, that we still don't know as in literally in terms of our understanding and uh, looking at uh, you know, digesting information around us literally there is treasure everywhere in terms of uh, knowledge that we can build so with that i will just take you through a few set of slides i have on how do we go about it uh i will briefly stop sharing in the sense uh i'm just wondering how do i get feedback from the participants uh just in case if you have anything uh, so the participants can write in the chat box uh, uh, and then we can uh, start discussing once right. you are uh, yeah participants yeah, so feel free to write in the chat box we'll take care of uh, providing the questions to sudhira right okay so i guess my challenge is i will not get to see the questions while i'm sharing this right we will intervene sure sure thank you all right 
So what I will do is I'll just quickly take you through uh, what's the research enterprise and how do we go about some of the basics of research there. Uh, so essentially the research enterprise revolves around understanding sort of the philosophy of science. How many of you can uh, identify the person in this slide? Yeah, I'll uh, uh, go ahead. Uh, this is Charles Darwin. So uh, post-industrialization, uh, we had uh, some of the thought leaders and uh, uh, a few eminent persons who came up with very interesting things that have changed the course of our lives. Uh, as in... Uh, the dominant worldview has been significantly shaped by these few individuals uh, from, say, Newton to Adam Smith and uh, Charles Darwin, because all of these folks uh, laid out a new grounding, the way the whole world is set up. And of course, there have been a few more who contributed later, but I think uh, one of the key uh, fundamental things that they did was to uh, establish the nice uh, sort of baseline or ring fence the entire or system in which how we can look at things. So, it's so did, uh, yeah. Sorry to interrupt. Could you be just a little louder? I think people are having little trouble hearing. Okay. So sorry about that. Uh, so essentially, in in the philosophy of science, the whole uh, game is to construct theories and define laws of properties of nature. So essentially what we are trying to do is understand what is happening around. Uh, that's a fundamental thing that we try to do and uh, see how best we can uh, build theories or like also define laws and say, okay. So I'm sure all of you know, like uh, you know, the classic example of the apple falling down. So it's just a phenomena that somebody observed and then defined uh, try to understand what is that really driving such a thing. And that led to defining what is now, what we now appreciate as the gravitation force, right? As in things like that. So there are a bunch of things, there are a lot of physical uh, phenomena around us that uh, we are trying to understand and uh, trying to build theories around that so that we enhance our understanding of how they are functioning. The reason that it has become all the more important today is because of the impact that as human civilization that we are doing on the earth, particularly like as Somdata mentioned a little while ago, with all the activities and our lifestyles that are driving, uh, they have caused significant amount of damage to the earth that has resulted in climate change. And the reason that, so that's, that's one of the key reasons that we need to really accelerate our understanding because we need to know what, at least what is, what is happening before we actually lose them or like, you know, understand what is really going on before the damage is done. And if you, if you kind of, for instance, if you look at things in ecology, like we are still at a point trying to understand uh, what are the species that are found, let's say in the Western Ghats or the Northeastern uh, states and stuff like that. And uh, we still don't have an accurate account of all the species that are presented. We are still describing new species of frogs, uh, some new ferns and whole bunch of things there. Now, at a state when we are still describing, as in a couple of years ago, we had a new bird species that got described in Arunachal Pradesh. So that was a fascinating discovery. Now, there are, since there were only a few individuals, in fact, the, the type specimen is also not just deposited in a museum as against an established practice. Now, in such a situation, what would have happened if we hadn't really discovered uh, that, that those species exist? So the point I'm making is the need for doing research and understanding of our uh, systems around us is so immense now is that we need to have a better understanding of what is going on and how best can we then try to make any course corrections to minimize those impacts. So that is that is the uh, essence of trying to under, under, undertake a research. So like I said, I'll just reiterate that a whole bunch of things that we do in, in, in the larger research enterprise is, is essentially to under, like construct the build theories 
and define laws of the properties of nature around us. Now, why should we do that? Because uh, the, the, in this whole uh, scheme of things that we are trying to do, our goal is knowledge production. So when we say even like, let's say I'll take the example of climate change. So when we are saying there is climate change, there has been a vast body of you know, research that has already come in to say what is happening. But while there are, while there is significant amount of research, there are still uh, vast gaps also that we still don't know of what will be the potential impacts. So the impacts are not only to humans, but also all other living organisms and other systems as in physical phenomena that are there. So in the larger scheme of things, anything that gets affected in the larger biosphere, it will ultimately either impact us, certainly it will impact humans, but it will also sooner uh, have a significantly earlier to all other living organisms. So all of us will know of, of you know, uh, uh, the ozone hole, right? As in depletion of the ozone layer and how it, it is causing a significant damage to the atmosphere. Now that has a different impact as in sometimes we have direct implication uh, uh, in that sense, but also sometimes because of the global warming, we also have indirect consequences like be it the rise of sea level and impacting all the coastal cities, right? It's not only in India, but globally. So most of our human civilization has been initially like come up around rivers and sea coasts, so that like they have they have a significant impact. Now coming back to our business of sort of knowledge production, right? Now what we try to do here is trying to see how best we can and you know build on uh, on the existing knowledge. Now I can't just do that right away in the sense. Uh, uh, it's not seriously like, let's say, uh, a storytelling or some fictional thing that I could do it. But of course, uh, any amount of imagination in science is welcome because uh, we need new imaginative ways of understanding and building that. But just that that has to be a systematic investigation. As in, there are existing methods, established methods one can follow to gather information and then establish laws around it. Or you come up with a new method altogether, as long as it is repeatable and one can then just repeat such an experiment or a method and then uh, reassure or reconfirm that this is what we found. I think that is still, pro that is pretty much accepted in research. So essentially what research tries to do is try to, tries to follow a very systematic method to gather information and then derive or make sense of that information and then establish laws around it. So most of us, right, as in uh, as scientists or researchers who are there, we are pretty much in the sort of business of knowledge production. So it's like uh, if you ask a businessman what they're trying to do, they say they are they're trying to be, make more money. Uh, for researchers or scientists, what you if you ask them what are they trying to do, they will say they are trying to produce more knowledge. That's a key different distinction that we have uh, between researcher and, and a business person. Now, like I was telling a little while ago, so bulk of our research sort of the way that we can carry out research rests on scientific methods. And some of these methods are well established. Uh, I, I understand the, like uh, you're all pretty much in class eight or up to class 12 or so. So I wouldn't uh, sort of try to nudge you, but there is a very stark distinction between methods and methodology. So I'm sure all of you would know what ology is. Ology is essentially study, study, uh, nothing but studying, uh, is, is studying something, right? As in, so you have biology, you have zoology and sociology and stuff like that. So a study on methods is what is called as a methodology. But there is also something called as methods. Often what has happened in, in research or in practice is that we have ended up uh, uh, using both methods and methodology almost interchangeably. I think uh, strictly as like something like a very orthodox uh, sense, uh, there are two distinct uh, terms. So uh, in, in methods, you're already invoking established methods to use. And in methodology, you're trying to understand or build a new method or trying to see what methods, uh, what are the methods that are there and 
how is it in, you know you know affecting the outcome of a study and stuff like that so that's a different uh, uh, thing altogether but in one of the methods that we know of is is invoking statistics uh, it's a, uh, again in a sense it is applied in, in a way applied mathematics where we uh, end up using how we are dealing with numbers uh, i'm sure some of you would have already had uh, some you know uh, elementary training on dealing with numbers uh, looking at means standard deviation and stuff like that what we try to do there is uh, try to understand those numbers uh, a little more deeply to uh, actually understand uh, to basically make sense of what our data has uh, got to say and how that can enhance our understanding of systems around it and and it's it's fun once you know it so uh, there is always sort of a, some sort of an initial apprehension about statistics there seems to be but i uh, my experience has been um, once you sort of know it it is fun and uh, you kind of uh, uh, you know it, it becomes easier for you to apply them and play around with it and uh, like i said it's really fun once you know it so the only effort one you have to make is uh, spend a little more time and uh, uh, a, a more pertinent or key thing to be studying like to st understand statistics is to shed away any sort of inhibition you may have on mathematics or statistics so you should generally have a, a very good you know interest or like i said shed away any inhibition about numbers there. the other thing that we also end up doing once you try to play around with numbers and draw insights around it maybe using statistics or so is communicate them uh, first primarily to in a peer reviewed sense to a journal article or even making a report as in uh, so there are there are established processes there and often uh, off late we have also started looking at communicating science uh, to public at large so typically any research or science that is carried out uh, unless it is communicated it is of no value in the sense uh, uh, one it has to be published and when now uh, earlier until recently it was just that as long as it is published in a journal article it is communicating but now the the uh, understanding of communicating uh, research has expanded to ensure that it has also reached your target audience as in if it is policy makers it has to reach there if it is public at large it has to be there because bulk of our research like particularly in india and perhaps more globally uh, is all funded by public money so every citizen as a tax whoever is a tax payer or not as as a citizen they generally have a right uh, to ask what is going on in terms of research so it become i think as researchers you are also one is also more accountable to kind of let people know uh, what research is carried out so one of the uh, other things that i think uh, is is more fundamental uh, when you try attempting to do research is being motivated so uh, let's say you you're looking at now looking at climate change it becomes important for you to identify what aspect of the uh, is really bothering you and so and hence uh, uh, why do you want to address it and sort of a, having a clear passion and motivation towards doing or addressing that is is very important because uh, without motivation it's very difficult and uh, so essentially because it's it's you and your research there and the other thing that is more important is also to get your fundamentals right so if you, if you come across anything just try to understand what what is it it actually is so that is where our bulk of our research also comes in as in how do we go about it right now let's say i make a very uh, generic statement saying uh, the temperature is rising or uh, of late in the last two years i feel the temperature is rising now how do i substantiate it as in when i say temperature is rising in in my place how do i substantiate it so i should come back with the right data or uh, or so in the sense when i say right data which means that i should have gathered uh so i should have used some method to gather data on what has happened to the temperature over the last few years and that has been systematically recorded and one has to look through it and then uh, can i make such an inference so 
but unfortunately when it comes to like climate and temperature and uh, or anything like that maybe may inferring one in within one or two three years is too short span of time for us to be jumping on to any conclusion but i can also still draw as in some inferences around it but it is important that you gather systematic information like i was telling and then look at it so when i say temperature how are you measuring or things like that so make we should make sure that whatever you're trying to do you kind of get to get to the nuts and bolts of it and then make sense of it in in the in the same line it's also important to have clarity in thought so when i say again saying temperature so uh, how is that uh, you know impacted so uh, is it because we had more uh, sunny days or was uh, like or the converse of it is whether there was more cloudy days or not so things like that so can we look at some data there to actually say that or understand what is really causing it is uh, uh, causing it in that sense so but to draw inference like i, I keep telling there to draw inferences we need to really look at data but also have a good clarity on the processes that is affecting the system as in what is what, what is really going on to which i think it is important for us to have clarity in thought so that's that's where you will have to keep thinking and Uh, ask questions within yourself as to what is going on, right? So like you can't just you shouldn't be simply accepting any statement or sentence that one says, including what I'm saying. In the sense, you should always try to question. That that's where I say you should like uh, keep asking question. Like I say, what, how, why, and stuff like that. The other thing that also is important is to be inquisitive, intuitive, and hungry for information and open-minded. now all of us right as in as uh, human beings uh, the way we have we are sort of wired is also a limitation in the sense uh, we build up our own mental models of the world the way we look at it or the way we have been trained to look at it so in the process we also end up making our own biases of things around as in uh, these are my likes these are my dislikes i also may be making assumption okay that city is clean this place is dirty or stuff like that or anything around that so we come up with our own set of biases and uh, while doing objective research it is very important to shed such biases and not allow our biases to come in the way of our doing research so it is important to always look at things from a very open minded it is easier said than done though but i think uh, uh, as a sort of a self uh, appreciation or things like that it is important to ensure you identify your biases and then try to minimize those biases as much as possible and also uh, be open to get any other information that you may have you never know from which corner of where he will get of course don't we may say today that you have google or whatever but i think there is also a lot of information that we get offline there is there could be a lot of archival information there could be a lot of written information uh, in in terms of some uh, uh, books or you know any other historical uh, or like i said archival literature and stuff like that uh, there there could be like bunch of things that we may not really know or that may not have still been sort of digitalized in that sense so uh it's, it's important for you to be really looking out for whatever information is available in that sense so in summary there i think it is important for you to keep questioning what how and why essentially whatever you're looking at and it is important to understand everything and ask question about what it is how it is working why is it working the way it is working or what is happening uh, how is it happening and why is it were happening the way it is happening right as in uh, do we really know what is happening there so in that sense so it is important to ha- ask these questions now when it comes to getting sort of getting into a more serious sense of research what we normally as in as in if you get into a master sort of sort of a doctoral research in that sense or looking at any publication so to say we sort of follow a more uh, structured process there in the sense you you identify a topic or ideate on something 
we formulate an hypothesis, try to gather data around it, analyze them, publish, present, and then hopefully get cited. Now, uh, a key thing for you to really look at when it comes to research uh, is also something we do uh, is formulating an hypothesis. As in, uh, it, it is a hypothesis is nothing but a statement. And what we try to do is try to ascertain whether uh, ascertain through the process of carrying out research, whether that statement is true or false, right? Now, like we use, that's where we end up using uh, established methods, including statistics to basically assert whether or test whether the hypothesis is correct or not. So either it could be, uh, I could state a sentence as an hypothesis and then say, this is my hypothesis there could be a null hypothesis or an alternate hypothesis. So let's not get there, but I think uh, it, uh, at the moment it would be useful for you to know that we try to formulate a hypothesis and test around it, right? And the other key thing I think uh, uh, we should realize is that research is never complete, as in it will never be complete, it's an ongoing process. So. Some of you, if you had a chance, you should take a look at, uh, let's say, Google Scholar, and uh, it's a service provided, one of the services pro provided by Google to look at academic literature. And there's a tagline there. It says, standing on the shoulder of change. This is, this is again, uh, a sentence shared by one of the scientists going there. So uh, what it essentially is that, uh, uh, like I said earlier, you try to build on existing knowledge. So you, like, I, you, if, if there are a bunch of people and then you ask them to assemble in a line and I, somehow I manage to stand on them, I get to see a much farther distance uh, beyond what we would actually see while standing on the ground. So now if, if again we group again and uh, somehow I can get to two levels, then I could see much further ahead. So similarly, what happens in research is we always try to uh, build on what is existing and also try to uh, go on like like, a, like the statement says, stash, standing on the shoulder of chains. So you build on existing body of knowledge to uh, try to add more knowledge onto it. And that process is, is a continuous thing. I don't think there'll be any state with the, like uh, in the at least to my imagination that we can say we know it all. And uh, I don't think it will be never ever complete there because it's an ongoing process. And I think uh, at a certain level, like I was telling earlier, we are also limited by how we are wired cognitively. As in, uh, to give you a very crude example, I'm sure many of you would be using mobile phones or laptops and you will say, okay, this is a GB RAM or this has so much of storage and stuff like that. And similarly, our brains, the way we have evolved, also have certain limitation. And uh, so bulk of our knowledge, our understanding of, of the world or the worldview that we have forming is also is sort of limited by how we are wired and how our, our, our daniel and our mental makeup is made there. So that I think is, is something that we should also be mindful of. And hence, I guess, uh, I suspect that limitation will not allow us to really uh, say or make, let's say we know it all. I think that that admission, uh, we should be ready to make such an admission there. So this is a larger thing of how do you go about it as in uh, finding the, the going about research. But uh, something that I would want to drive down here is in the whole process of research that we would want to do, one of the essential things is, is just formulating a question, right? As in uh, uh, deriving what is that we would want to really investigate is something that we need to really, uh, or framing that question is, is super essential. And that uh, itself is, is, is a research in, in uh, uh, a process of research there. Now, how do you find a key question is, uh, is like I said, is research in itself. Uh, we do have researchers who just formulate a problem and that 
gets published as paper itself as in that makes it some logical end to an ongoing research. So, uh, but finding that question can happen uh, once we try to ascertain uh, what are the existing like knowledge there and what is the gap in understanding of, of the existing that such knowledge there and how much we do we know or can we make any assertion or inferences around that. So in the process of that, what we try to then know is that you will like, discover that there are so many things that there is a gap, there are gaps in knowledge. So based on that, we end up trying to formulate our question and make these hypotheses and then define objectives for our research. So uh, to kind of uh, break this down, to make it more uh, simple, so to say, uh, some of the things that, like say, I, I was talking about some new species of frogs that were discovered, right? While the new species are still new, like I let them be new, uh, I'm sure many of you would know of frogs that are around, the bullfrogs or something like that, uh, that, that are pretty common here. But uh, do we know how long do they live? I'm afraid no. In the sense, uh, we really don't have a sense of uh, uh, what is the lifespan of some of the frogs that are found uh, uh, around, not some of them, most of the frogs, as in except, like, at least, uh, to a significant extent, large amount, uh, all the frogs that are in India, we really don't know their uh, natural lifespan. And we are, uh, at, at this point of time, we are still at this point where we're trying to understand who all are present. We still don't have a deeper appreciation of their ecology or their behavior and, and many other things there. So something like that, right? Or let's say uh, you live in a place uh, and uh, do you know how many trees are around? Or how green is your place or city or a town or wherever you're living? So to answer the question, how do you, how would you answer that? So to that, then I would need an assessment of how many trees are there. And unfortunately, I'm not sure if we have data on how many trees are there in a given area. As in, if it is a forest area, I know it is very difficult to also get to know the numbers, but I'm sure if it is it is a settlement or like a town or a city, then we have methods to actually go about counting them or making an enumeration of that and then say, okay, uh, so for this place, okay, this is there. So for instance, I can say uh, Indranagar, uh, a neighborhood in Bangalore has about 10 trees per hectare. So that uh, that is a number that we have. With that estimate, then I can say at large, Bangalore has about, uh, for an area of about 800 square kilometers, has about roughly uh, 800,000 trees, as in, so we have some estimates there, but that has that uh, that estimates has been derived from a more uh, accurate assessment of uh, how many trees are there in a neighborhood or in in some neighborhoods of the city. So how do we then? So that's where you know answering those questions depends on how good your data is, but also to see uh, where you are getting that from, right? But I'm sure not all places you would have such there, uh, information available for which you will have to make, uh, you know, uh, like uh, devise your experiment or plan around to see how do you go about that, right? As in making an assessment of that in that sense. So things like that. So, uh, or, or what is the most common tree around? Or what is the uh, what are the different type of grasses that you find around? Or stuff like that, right? So there are so many things that we still, uh, I'm sure we don't have answers to. And that is where it becomes important for us to uh, plan things out to go about doing research. And in that process, you follow these uh, uh, methods. I will not get into this detail right away, but uh, you're free to bother me anytime during this uh, uh, challenge so that I can help, uh, come back and help on this uh, as you frame things better or need inputs on that, right? I will just uh, 
I'll, I'll move on this slide, but I'll be happy to come back on this and uh, answer anything as like if, whenever you need, if you want to get into more details on this. Now, to formulate, so like I was telling, one of the key things is formulating the question. Now to do that, I, I did mention that it is important to understand what is the existing literature uh, or also to see what, what is the knowledge gap. There is also a very fundamental thing uh, why there is, there is this established process of doing a literature review is also to build our own understanding at large. Because uh, like I said, we have our own biases and all of that. But in the process of doing a literature review, we will also gain, like it's like pretty much like reading some new thing altogether and uh, expanding our knowledge or horizons of you know, knowledge that we have already. So it will not necessarily be looking at, uh, you know, um, go, sort of reading for your exam class examinations in whatever science or mathematics or stuff like that. But if you're looking at something that is trying to understand a problem and all of that, you may be ending up reading a lot of new, new information, new knowledge, uh, gaining new knowledge there. And, uh, and with that, then you will try to see what is the gap that you would want to fill there. Right? And based on that, you will tend to formulate your objective hypothesis and the research question. Now, this formulation itself is is an exercise so in the challenge i think uh, i'm sure uh, sundata and rahul can clarify that i think even if you are formulating the right question as part of this challenge and are uh, suggesting how you uh, indicating how you and then putting them together is also uh, part of the research itself because i think asking a right question is also a research in that sense right absolutely not necessarily uh, sort of giving a solution. So the other thing that I would want to bring up when I said the solution is, I think uh, some of us given our training on things uh, uh, or generally the worldview that we have tend to uh, observe around or build around, look around, is that we tend to look at things towards solutioning or sort of see if you can arrive at a solution, so to say, but not necessarily. Uh, like, uh, I think a larger problem we have globally is uh, uh, not necessarily arriving at solutions, but I think uh, a more fundamental one is enhance our understanding of how things work. So sort of, uh, even when it comes to cities, uh, while over the last uh, century or two, there have been numerous work that has happened uh, on understanding how so human social organizations uh, work or evolve and how we've come to form cities and all bunch of things around that or, you know, the whole methods of you know, planning or issues on governance, public transport, you name it. But still, I think our understanding of how cities were is woefully inadequate. And this is what something uh, Professor Michael Batty at the University College of London says, that the more we know, the less we would want to intervene, but in more meaningful ways. I think this applies pretty much to our understanding of climate change as well. Because I think uh, our understanding of the larger things, we think even has an impact of climate change or what is causing climate change also is, is still woefully inadequate. And uh, enhancing our understanding in, in the sense, the more we know of what is going on, I think that will help us to identify areas of intervention uh, or rather very specific areas of intervention than trying to do everything that we would want to do, right? I think uh, like, Again, restating what Batty says, uh, intervening in, in uh, uh, places uh, like like restating that the more we know, the less we would want to intervene, but in more meaningful ways, right? I think that is more paramount here. Uh, with that, I'll briefly stop here with another uh, Kevin and Hobbes strip. Uh,
uh, where he's saying problems often look overwhelming at first. And so Calvin says, continues saying, the secret is to break problems into small manageable chunks. And if you deal with those, you are done before you know it. So he says, for example, I'm supposed to read this entire history chapter. It looks impossible, so I break the problem down. So this is asking, you focus on reading the first section. He says, I ask myself, so do I even care? So this is on a very lighter note as in how Calvin uh, or treats a problem. One, maybe it is breaking down, but also trying to see uh, whether should you be really overwhelmed at the problem. As in basically it's, it's, it's the outlook that you would want to take is how do you want to deal with the problem. As in you don't necessarily have to be overwhelmed, but uh, you can actually go around it and then see how do you want to tackle it. I'll uh, stop here. And yes, Sadira. In the meantime, there are some questions which I have gotten. Maybe we address those before we move in next. Yes. Yeah. So, Shri Hari, uh, who has been one of the very enthusiastic participants of the Climate Change Challenge, uh, he wanted to know if they can conduct a survey so that they can understand the view of them. Shri Hari, do you want to explain your question in a little more detail so that Sadira can address that? Ma'am, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, madam, uh, I think the floor and uh, fauna of the uh, school is becoming weak by the temperature is going high. The butterfly, mm -hmm. uh, then uh, by conducting survey, we can uh, clarify the... So we, uh, at least I could only hear you in bits and parts, but what I understood is that uh, there is rising temperature and because of that, the flora and fauna around your school is uh, changing and you want to conduct a survey to understand how it is changing. Is that Madam, correct, Sri Madam, I want to conduct survey uh, to uh, check whether the students in the school or life realize this pro uh, this problem. Okay. Yeah. And under what uh, section in the climate change challenge do you want to put this? At a research. Okay. So will this be a research on awareness of students on how climate change is affecting Adam, their impact impact on uh, impact of climate change on the school premises or Okay. Local area. All right. Sadira, how do you want to think around this? Sure. Yeah, I guess that's an interesting thought that you are, you're trying to think through there. Uh, one, uh, I think it is important to do us like nice to do a survey of students understanding what climate change is. They are, uh, do they understand or what views do they have on it? I think that will be a good uh, uh, sort of an to establish a baseline of understanding uh, of climate change in and around your locality. So it will, which will require some careful uh, creation of some instrument to measure it carefully. When I say an instrument, it will be mostly typically a questionnaire to actually go about doing such a survey. With that, one you could do what you could do is typically get a sense of what uh, uh, is the understanding. But uh, uh, to also say uh, or ask in the same question, to say there has been an impact of climate change, I think it's a little tricky because unless we have data to say that there has been an impact, uh, that becomes uh, a tricky thing there. But I also see from your uh, chat that you were asking on questions on whether there is temperature and uh, precipitation data available. I think we have, today we have globally a lot of data available on that uh, from satellite remote sensing to a lot of things that are available in public domain, but that will require some more, uh, some some sort of uh, skills also to uh, play around with that. But uh, to answer your question, yes, there it is available in that sense. Uh, and also, Sadira, can uh, newspaper reports uh, be also taken as 
evidences for changes happening in flora and fauna. I'm, I'm talking of newspaper reports because probably our students uh, will find it easier to find those kinds of reports and understand those reports better than academic papers. Yeah, I think one can certainly use newspaper reports as well. But uh, I, I guess the, the, key, the, the trick or the key thing there is uh, making the right inferences or before that also asking the right question as to what is that you would want to gather from the newspaper. Hmm. So I, I could also think of, let's say, thinking aloud, saying uh, how has environment reporting on environmental issues improved in the newspaper? So I can pick up some three or four newspapers generally uh, like do a random check on how many stories on the environment or climate change have been reported and then uh, make a simple tabulation and say uh, newspaper a b c d had so many stories so based on that uh, you could say this but if, if you see that all newspapers had a similar reporting then that is one the other thing that we could also look at is do it over time let's say in or oh, like i can do it for every year so to say if you have access to such information and then say in how many instances we had this so let's say i can pick up uh, a canada daily in karnataka and then say do we how many news reports were there that talked about instances of floods or heavy rainfall in in this place so if i then look at it uh, i know also like that there have been instances of excessive rainfall and that resulting in flood and mostly such in, such news would have appeared irrespective of whether a particular newspaper reporting more on environment or not right as in the, because that would have affected life at large so such a thing would certainly be reported and that would be meaningful to look at over time so one can construct a uh, uh, sort of uh, experiments or, or, or methods around it to uh, sort of do a systematic assessment on that. With that, also trying to make uh, a more uh, objective mm -hmm. inference around it. Okay. Uh, so, Sriyari, that is also, I mean, I think his other question was also about how uh, what are citations and bibliography? And I bring that question up now because if you're talking about newspapers, I think it's also related there. Yes. So, okay, I can go on, on the citation and bibliography. So, um, first, I think what is important uh, in, in research as in the general practice of ethics in research is for us uh, to state appropriately uh, any information that is not, or like, or tell who's, who first told you that information or from where you, right? So uh, I can't just say today that, uh, again, taking the example of gravity, that uh, I discovered gravity or I, I wrote a new question because that is already established. So if I'm doing something on gravity, I should go back to the person who actually first, who's first uh, formally uh, written about it, right? As in, in, that's the practice. So in science uh, or in research at large, the, the when it comes to uh, sort of the established ethics there, is that we should always cite any information that is not ours uh, appropriately. So it could, that, that source of information could be newspapers, could be published research, or at times even personal communications, right? Typically in, in, in sort of more professional research, we sort of discredit any personal uh, uh, sources, but uh, we try to largely uh, rely on published journal articles, right? And when you're try trying to use any information from published in the article, so you're trying to use them and then uh, sort of cite them appropriately. So when I say cite them, so like, uh, uh, let's say there is something, uh, there's some study on uh, 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 related to water bodies in Hyderabad. 
So I know, let's say for instance, Anand Marignati has done some work there. So I have used, I was looked up his study and I've used some information available from his work. So I will then say uh, Anand Maring, uh, like Maringati, and then we follow a set method in even how do you write such a reference. So there are different standards available uh, from APA, Harvard uh, style and whole uh, Chicago uh, reference styling and all of it. So we follow one of them as in, but be consistent in which, whichever method you follow and then try to uh, tell, okay, Maringati in this year and which publication name, which title, paper of the title of the paper, which publication year and all of that, and then say had, had this. So we kind of cite that problem. So it is important, uh, like I said, to state any information that is not ours uh, and credit the original source, uh, including mentioning the author and the nature of that source that could be potentially a publication or even a newspaper or personal information, right? Things like that. So, and then when we say bibliography, it is, it is also like how at the end of your uh, article or any publication that you may write, uh, how do you uh, list them out? So I, if I, so basically the practice is listing out all the sources of information that you have tried to cite in the text of your report or a article. So at the end, you make a list of all of them that you have cited and present it as a, what, the list of references as a bibliography. Now, again, as a best practice or the standard practice, you only need to list all those sources of information as citations in the list of references as bibliography of only those that you have sourced information from. So I can't just say uh, list every book that I have read or every research paper that I have read in the bibliography. You need to only mention only those that you have actually used information from for that work and that you have cited in the text of your report or the journal publication. Does that answer your question, Srihari? Yes, sir, clear. Rahul, are you around? Okay. I think the next question should go to you. Sorry, yeah, one thing. What is yeah. the... Yeah, so Dhruva Nair asks, yeah. is there an institute or department which has done research before and have found solutions to the climate change? You can have your camera on, Rahul. Sure. So, uh, Dhruva, that's a wonderful question. And, uh, you know, it's essentially the question everybody needs to finally ask, which is saying, you know, what is the work which is being done here and what is the true solution and what can I do as an individual to solve this problem? So, it's a complicated issue. I think what... Uh, Somdatta and the speakers have done through this climate change challenge is try to present the problem to you in a very simple and easy to understand fashion, but make it make sure that it is based in science itself uh, and through the scientific process, right? There is no one solution to this particular problem, uh, which I can say or anybody can say to you, uh, do this and things will get back to the way it was. Uh, and, and that is, uh, you know, part of the reason for me saying that is because you actually have your climate of the planet, which has varied and changed naturally itself and has been doing so for a long period of time, right? Certainly for millions and millions of years, right? You guys know this, if you all have seen the movie Ice Age, right? You all have seen that at that point, many parts of the earth was covered with ice, right? And now when we look at it, things are getting a little warmer. Is this the warmest the Earth has ever been? The answer is no. Several hundred million years ago, it was very, very hot. There was much more CO2 in the atmosphere too. This is before human beings were around. Uh, you know, there were two times in Earth's history when the entire planet was covered with ice. And it was super cold. It was called a snowball Earth. The entire planet fully covered with ice, right? So there have, of course, been times when naturally there's been variation. 
And uh, what we're trying to sort of emphasize to you all is that over the last 100, 150 years since the Industrial Revolution, the amount of CO2 that human beings have added has been at a very fast pace. So even though there is natural variability, there is also a sizable contribution and maybe even a greater than the natural variability contribution from human beings, right? Uh, in terms of, uh, you know, just keep that in the back of your mind uh, to, to sort of, you know, understand what we can try to look in terms of solutions itself. Uh, there are many, many institutes, many departments, many people, researchers who are actively working on the climate problem. Uh, you might actually find this a little surprising, uh, but the first time that somebody mentioned in a scientific paper using all the scientific methodology that Sudhira has explained to you today, the first time it was mentioned that uh, CO2 due to human causes is altering the you know, uh, planetary uh, energy balance and the temperature was actually done in 1896. So we're talking about something which is you know, several hundred years old now already. And this was by somebody called Arrhenius. So, so it's not that you know people were not thinking about this earlier on as well. Uh, there are lots and lots of uh, agencies that work on this from the science perspective. Each country has you know its own ministries, and under those ministries there are several programs which run. Uh, India has it uh, its ministry, which is called Ministry of Forest, uh, Earth, and Climate Change. So you know so so. So through that, you know, a lot of uh, high level institutes are doing research in India. Uh, there is something called the IPCC, which has been formed where several governments have come together. And, uh, you know, they are the body which actually produces a lot of the reports. And this has been happening for a long period of time. And you can go to their website and get all this information. Uh, so that's about uh, institutes and and and, and uh, individual researchers. Lots of them are there, and in terms of solutions, it's a little bit more tricky. So there are some solutions that people are proposing, but the solutions have to be a combination of global level, something called geoengineering. People are actually thinking maybe we need to go to the moon and put mirrors so that the incoming sunlight can be reflected back and so you know things can cool down people in uh, university of arizona are actually making uh, artificial trees and those trees are you know they're not like what you and me think of when we think of trees uh, but they actually take co2 and convert it into oxygen and so they are putting it in various places but the solutions also have to be local and you and me and everybody in this particular call can actually start to think about what is a local sort of issue of climate change in your neighborhood or in your school. And can I come up with a local solution? It may not solve the climate change problem entirely, but can I actually even begin to start talking about what might work in my particular neighborhood or my school? Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Yeah, great. Lovely question. Excellent question. Thank you so much, both of you. Let's go to Parvati now. Parvati comes from Kerala, and she is concerned about the constant floods that her state and other neighboring states are constantly facing these days. And she wants to think around how the students can take measures to prevent it. So, Parvati, we would like to... First, hear from you on how you might want, I mean, what do you think are the key things that uh, should be done for this? And then our experts will also chip in. Sudhira and Rahul and I, all of us will uh, talk about it. Parvati, can we hear from you first? Yes, ma'am. I think uh, there are, uh, we are uh, using the... Um, there are many mountains over here in Kerala and we are using all these urban summits and um, maybe due to that and also there are 
lots of leaks uh, and um, many water uh, sources that we are actually uh, covering with for our own uses. So this may be uh, also the problem that actually cause uh, floods. So uh, if you have identified the problems which are causing floods, then what are the challenges in stopping those from happening? Um, the government should um, take the measures to prevent this. Mm -hmm. And why do you think government is not taking measures for this? Because to uh, maintain the economic activity, uh, mm -hmm. and now we are facing the corona pandemic. So actually, uh, now we are in the green, uh, actually in economic depression. And in order to overcome that, Parvati, I can't. Hear you? Uh, okay. Yeah. Rahul or Sudhira, if you were able to hear Parvati well, can you address her questions? Yeah, I, I, uh, if I can sure. restate positively what I understood uh, Parvati is asking, uh, I think she uh, one. Um, is trying to one articulate on the issue of, of the recent flights or the ongoing flights in Kerala, and also how like how students can take measures on it in that sense, uh, and perhaps what should as students what should they what they can do? Is that right, Parvati? Parvati, well. Uh, I think you're right, Sudhira. You can't hear her, but I think that's what she was trying to do. Right. So, on that note, I think, first, uh, uh, I think what is important is like for us to uh, get a sense of, okay, uh, we do observe that there has been increased or uh, whatever instances of flight there. Uh, it is important to understand a large, uh, slightly larger things around. Uh, why flights occur is primarily can start with understanding our basic ideological system, which essentially implies uh, how our rivers and streams. Uh, I think bulk of the damage of what we see as floods is 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 again uh, from a human centric or anthropocentric sense, right? So it is only in the recent past we have seen uh, that uh, there is like our uh, if we are trying to make sense or state that okay the floods are recent and it is causing whatever uh, affecting humans. But uh, to assert that that has this has not happened as yet, I think we need to really look at historical data as to what has happened. I think the other key problem there is like I said is trying to understand hydrology at large. Because uh, uh, understanding how our stream network, uh, we have first, second, third, or other higher order streams that I guess pretty much originate in the West Let's say Kerala is a fantastic place there. So you have a lot of uh, southern western guards uh, there. And um, it, uh, because of the terrain, you have numerous streams that get originated. Now, as the streams flow, they have been over uh, millions of years carrying water uh, due to monsoon rains or other rainfall that happens there and carrying through it uh, that will lead to the sea. Now, I think what we need to really understand is uh, from a perspective of whether it's, it's the same rainfall that is happening and but if, they, if it was the same rainfall, how is it that now it is sort of suddenly hitting us on our face that it seems to be causing floods? So it is important for us to understand uh, what other interventions have we done to the natural ecosystem 
beat building plans or damaging the existing streams or building very close to the rivers and any uh, water bodies there because of which you know certainly have an instance of increased flooding like in cities for sure i know uh, for a fact that the way we have abused our third or second order streams has caused uh, flooding in urban areas as we have you now recently seen in hyderabad or bangalore earlier and so on so i think uh, uh, it is also our in sort of in sense how we have encroached into the natural space and suddenly we see hitting that hitting us and now hence we say that this can increase the instance of flood uh but it depends on how you would want to look at it and how uh, uh, what data you would get around it. so for which it is important for as students to organize uh to first understand what is going on and then tell people around as to what should be done or what should like how many maybe we should try to do all of that for which we need a better understanding so as students what we should try to do first is look uh, look around as to what are the existing water structures what has happened to it and what has there been any interventions on them and hence what should happen around it so instead of trying to find the solution i think it is important to ask the right questions and having discussions with them and through those discussions i'm sure we will try to find solutions or find at least reasons for what is going on does that sound good okay rahul would you like to add anything to it uh yeah i think uh, sudhir has sort of touched upon all the important points parvati uh, did you understand what uh, the answer was and uh, but i think you know maybe just to put it in a larger context in terms of even if you are thinking of projects and this is something which seemed interesting to you which is that floods are happening in your state and uh, no doubt you have learned in the challenge already that uh, you know one of the ways in which climate change is affecting us is that extreme weather events such as lots of rainfall uh, tends to become more frequent right so there are more events of higher amounts of rainfall and often that can lead to let's say flooding of um, you know rivers and and so on and so forth to flood their banks uh so that's one way in which you can link it to climate change uh why do things why do these rivers and streams flood so dira has mentioned very nicely and that is partially because development is uh, taking place in such a manner in many cases where uh, you know natural sort of stream flows and those sort of things have now been affected right we uh, now it's again a difficult question and uh, there is no straight answer to it because of course with our large population you need to try to give them amenities for people to live better for them to have their own space and housing and so on so forth so it's not a simple uh, question of saying do not build at all but yet can we and you touched upon this parvati already in your uh when you were talking with somrata about saying yes development is happening and a lot of economics is involved and no doubt that is true and that is why i think one of the things for us to think about in terms of solutions is to think about what they call sustainable development is it possible to have development but yet not have our environment get degraded very bad right so that's something to think about but again a wonderful question and i think you can think of this in terms of a potential project too uh we can discuss that a little later but just as a thought process and if for all the participants you could go to some resources we could help you find to say have the amount number of days of very excessive rainfall in kerala or specifically in a region uh, in kerala where you live has that increased over time then you can figure that out if it has then has the num- number of floods increased much more in the last few years compared to let's say 30 or 40 years or 100 years ago and you can then start to make a connection with uh climate change being responsible for that 
and then talk a little bit about how development has taken place, let's say, in your neighborhood or in your part of the city. And uh, you can talk to your grandmother, grandfather and ask, was it like this in your time and or how has development changed in my neighborhood? And now is there more flood in and around where I live compared to when you were here? Right. So just some ideas. But again, wonderful question. Thank you. Great. So in, in connection to that, uh, Dhruva asked a question and I'm going to rephrase Dhruva's question. So Dhruva wants to know, some people think that floods occur when roads are made. Is that true? And I want to rephrase or add an aspect to the question that how do we even know that these are true? How do I figure out that, okay, we made this road so there are floods happening? Should I go? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it's again not so simple. Uh, and it is not just to say I built one road and therefore it flooded. But what you know is, you know, there are these maps which have existed of surveys that governments have done and development plans are made by city officials. And you can go to their websites and find all development plans. So in some cases, why why are you thinking in this term, Dhruva, is probably because you might have read in some newspaper article or somebody mentioned to you that, uh, you know, roads are causing floods, right? And so some in some cases, what we do see is that where there used to be existing channels, right, where a river would get into a stream and that would drain into a nala and go, it would follow the slope of the land, right? Because water always will flow from high level to low level elevation. And so in some cases, when you are, let's say, needing to build your infrastructure, you need a road to be connecting two points, right? And in some cases, what has happened is when you look at these plans, you see what used to be an area where water used to flow got built over. Now, it's not only just a road, but there could be other infrastructure built as well. And so what used to be the natural flow has now been changed. And once that is changed, chances are that water will not have its regular way to flow and therefore can end up accumulating in some places and that's why you hear of buildings getting flooded or uh, you know other neighborhoods getting flooded and so on so does that make sense yes, yeah so uh, so Dira, do you want to add anything to it uh, no uh, pretty much i guess what uh, uh, you know the said is there but yeah i can just add that uh, like again, perhaps if I may be at the risk of restating, there are no simple solutions in that sense. Mm. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think it's, it's a choice we make of sort of a very, uh, in a sense, uh, informed decision of the, you know, risks that we are taking on these things. So uh, there are instances where we need to build roads for larger uh, context in that sense but uh, uh, the choice of where it has to be built, how it has to be built there can be interventions on that as in trying to minimize any potential impacts around that. So uh, a more consciously uh, approached uh, uh, path on development is something that is being stressed upon uh, which, which is largely called as sustainable development uh, so, Sudhira, unfortunately, uh, yeah. No, uh, I'll so finish. I'll, I'll ask then. Yeah. So, what I was telling you, unfortunately, we don't have a silver bullet. Uh, in the sense, there is no one size fits all anywhere. So, we'll have to make a very uh, strike. It, it, it is easier to say we need to strike a balance, but it is always difficult. So, uh, wherever any uh, uh, development professional or uh, an administrator is there. It's always a difficult uh, choice or a decision that one has to make. But uh, it is always useful to make uh, an informed decision of of the potential impacts, knowing knowing how it could really impact. Work. So, uh, what I also wanted to ask you, Sudhira, is what can citizens do in this? So. 
I mean, I mean, just about their own city as well. Like, can citizens become a driving force of how the development pattern can look like in the city, or it is necessarily an administrator's uh, decision that is always taken into account? Well, uh, I think cities, uh, when it comes to cities or any settlements in India, uh, constitutionally we have uh, sort of a participatory model that is existed. But for a variety of reasons, uh, it is it is it may not be very effective. But however, uh, uh, I know for a fact that uh, local governments in Kerala, for instance, have been doing very well. Uh, Result of a better state to But having said that, uh, at large, right, in cities or in small town or even a village, so we have numerous things that one can do to look at and sort of uh, understand cities better or you know, our, our ecosystems better and see what we can do as citizen scientists. So there are like one, if you if you just wear your cap as a citizen scientist you could go about looking at and trying to gather information on a whole lot of things. Let's say, for instance, uh, I can also ask a very simple question. What is the most common bird in your neighborhood? I, I very much doubt if you have a ready answer on it. You would say, maybe start saying, okay, some jungle crow or maybe mina or let's say blue rock pigeon or something else, or even a spire, or depending on where you're living. But uh, I'm not sure if you have a ready answer there. Uh, to arrive at a ready answer, you may need to make up some observation, which has to be very systematic and over time. So for which I think, as if you, if you generally as students, right, if you get together and let's say uh, you start making observations every weekend or over, over on a Sunday or something like that, and try to get to know or make a just to generally make an attendance of what birds you see there and maybe do it every Saturday or Sunday for over six months and then look up look up on the data there. And it will be striking to you that what you thought maybe as not so common would be common or otherwise. So for instance, you may end up seeing more black kites depending on where you are or even a blue rock pigeon, stuff like that. So I think once we start gathering information or become a citizen scientist, you will gain more insights on that. So once you know, okay, which is the most common bird, then you can start trying to ask a much deeper question or the next level of question asking, why is it common? Or uh, what is happening to different types of birds? So when you look at birds itself, then you, you have uh, uh, frugivores that only depend on free, you know, fruits or some uh, are canopy dwellers, some are like sort of uh, birds of prey. So you can group them across different categories and then say, why is some group of birds or why are they some group of birds dominant or otherwise and stuff like that. So you can start looking at their assemblages, so to say, and then ask uh, further more questions around it. While it is like similar to birds, I can also ask a similar question as to which is the most abundant tree in your neighborhood. So depending on uh, which city you are in or what type of neighborhood you are in, you will you will encounter there are many different uh, like some of some trees are very common, but uh, you, but there could also be some uh, not so common trees. So I can reverse the question there, which is the most uh, or rather rarest tree that you have seen in your neighborhood? Is it a sandalwood tree, or it is or is it some other tree? Like for instance, at IIAC, we have a, uh, we have a climber called Entada that is supposedly only found in the Western Ghats, but thanks to one of our faculty members who brought it to IIAC, it's, it's also sort of survived there. So it's a very rare tree that you can find in Bangalore, as in perhaps the only one in Bangalore. Right? So things like that. So you could also uh, you know, look at different things from the question itself, but for which it will impo be important for you to look around and uh, uh, put the wear a cap of a citizen scientist. There are a host of citizen science-based activities one can do from watching birds. So there are for birds, you have something called eBird. You could simply quickly look up on that and start looking at birds there. So we also have uh, a lot of citizen science projects 
around frogs too. So uh, there has been something called as mapping Malabar toad that Dr. Kevi Guraja started primarily to look at Malabar toad. Uh, it's a type of frog that is found across. I think I'm sure some of you are from Kerala and I suspect it is also found there. Or you could pick up any frog that is found around. Or basically take an attendance of what frogs you have around. That will be a very interesting exercise. So you can, there is a bunch of things. So even we have season watch uh, to look at uh, when, which type of, uh, which flowers come and what happens, so things like that. So you can you can be making more, many more observations. Around. There are so many things around us, so like I said, we still don't know of, of what they are and all of it. So if you, if you take up any such activities, it will be nice to do that. Or if you know of any simple weather station that you can uh, get hold of, or you can build your own uh, uh, rain gauge system. So there are a bunch of things that you can do as a, a, like, a, that you, you can search on the internet to make your own uh, do-it-yourself rain gauge uh, using some pet bottle types. And then you can make your own observations of how much rainfall happened. If somebody says it rained very heavily, you can then say, well, what is very heavy? Was it 10 mm or, once, uh, <laughs> or uh, 100 mm? Things like that, as in within a given duration of time. So things like that you could do and uh, like for which you, you, you can you know embrace a lot of such activities as a citizen scientist. I think there are many such avenues. Uh, I'm sure uh, if you're interested, we can put together and share them. Uh, I guess uh, Somdutta and Rahul uh, may have already have some things around that. Somdutta? Right. So, uh, and then like when somebody gets data around these factors. I mean, it could be the amount of rainfall or which birds are found more commonly now and which ones are not found or how has the fruiting or flowering patterns changed. Then the citizens also have the power of spreading that information, I think. Right. That is true. As in once you know, as in you're putting things together, uh, uh, you can also build uh, your own such information. Again, I, I can think of a very good citizen science activity that happened in Kerala is the Kerala's uh, bird atlas. Uh, uh, we had similar one in Mysore as well. Uh, and uh, uh, across India, there have been some birding groups uh, we know of. Uh, but at, at large, I think uh, uh, the birders in Kerala were able to put in so much of data that was sufficient to generate a bird atlas and that was useful to raise awareness across to more people to understand what type of birds occur where and in, during what seasons, uh, when are which migratory birds coming in, not coming in and stuff like that. So there are many different things that one can do uh, as in uh, looking at birds, uh, for instance, or even rainfall. So if you as a gather data and you can just with the sheer amount of data that as citizen scientists one would generate, that, that that is a wonderful set of things to actually put out and uh, raise more awareness about it. Right. Thanks. Uh, I guess uh, we don't have any more questions. And before we wrap up the session today, Rahul, would you like to give our participants a flavor of other resources where they can take a look at and take inspiration from on how they can think of art or uh, think of research questions around climate change? Yeah, I'll do that and maybe we can send this to the participants. Since uh, as an email as well, yeah. By email. But I think, um, you know... You might want to share your screen and give them an idea of the websites. Okay, uh, one second. But uh, while I'm doing that, uh, why don't we uh, sort of hear from the participants a little more mm -hmm. and uh, you know just to get a sense of uh, you know you all have sat through some of these talks right now some mm -hmm. uh, you find maybe some parts of it you all found interesting some parts you all found uh, that you would like to potentially do some work on so uh, just some preliminary thoughts and this doesn't have to be the final thought process also of what what is it that is of interest to you or what has been interesting to you through this sort of, you know, different talks that you've heard about the climate change challenge? What is one aspect that you might want to 
look at uh, towards doing some work. <laughs> is that something you all would like to talk? Please don't feel shy. This is not a right or a wrong answer type of deal. We just want to hear what was most interesting to you as an individual, and do you have any ideas of what you might want to move on towards for a, for your project itself? So Divya and Dikshita, we haven't heard from you at all. So if you would like to speak, I'll be very very happy. Don't feel shy at all. There's no right answer, wrong answer. Okay, anybody of you. Okay. Uh, Ma'am, can I? Yes, Shri Hari. Yes. yes. Ma'am, I found uh, most interesting about coral bleaching and the fragile ecosystem of Lakshadweep and Himalayas. Mm -hmm. And why did you think that you found them the most interesting? Ma'am, because of the uh, algae in the uh, that coral. Mm -hmm. Then uh, how fragile they are. Mm -hmm. the, uh, small change in the uh, temperature in the sink mm -hmm. can cause a huge damage to their ecosystem. Mm -hmm. That's why yeah. I found them. Nice. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. So what would you like to do about this? Now, I know some of the conversations we've had so far has been that, you know, we're saying it's a complex problem. But that doesn't mean that we cannot make some effort towards being part of the solution. And then our local solutions, our individual solutions, and then at our community level, you know, a combination of this would actually lead to a substantial sort of uh, effort from, from all of humanity finally. But, you know, if we don't start, then it doesn't, you know, move on any further. So any thoughts you all might have in terms of, uh, I, I think it was who, Srihari, did you, did you say that the coral ble bleaching was interesting to you? Yes, yes, sir. So have you seen a coral reef before yourself? No, sir. Only in pictures. Yeah. And so maybe one of the things you could think about is that where are the corals in India? Lakshadweep, where else do you think it could be? Uh, Near the Andamans, there's a lot of corals. And, you know, even in the Arabian Sea, I know there is not much, but there is. there are places in and around Maharashtra's coast also where there will be some corals which are there. Yes. So one thing, and Sudhira mentioned in today's uh, talk, is to actually go... And the research process involves what? First, to go and find the right resources. And, you know, maybe one thing could be that go and find where are the coral resource, coral reefs around India, right? And then to see that is there any resource which is talking about the fact that the corals in India are getting bleached? And I think the comic book itself might give you some sort of, you know, hints about where that might be. And then, you know, why is it getting bleached? So, do you have an idea about why corals are getting bleached? Sir, can I tell? Yes, please. Uh, because of the increase in temperature and the zoom cancer in, uh, in the coral goes to uh, sea and the coral dies. Yes, so there is an increase in temperature and there's also, uh, you know, so your seas are getting warmer, but you're at the same time, what else is happening? If due to human caused global warming, there's a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere itself. But uh, maybe from your earlier lectures, you realize that that carbon dioxide is actually being taken up and the heat is being taken up by the oceans also. It's not that it stays only in the atmosphere, right? So all of our spheres, atmosphere, hydrosphere, lithosphere, biosphere, they are linked, right? And so what is happening to the oceans? They're becoming more acidic. 
And as they are becoming more acidic, that is where our marine life is starting to get more and more affected, right? So I can uh, share with you uh, <clears throat> some sort of uh, resources related to this, and you all could take a look at it. Okay, anybody else has some uh, thing which they found very interesting? Your personal lifestyle, the fashion one? Sir, I oh. find interesting in plastics and CO2 temperature. Plastics? And CO2, carbon dioxide in the air. Yeah. So which part of plastics did you see? The Sir, You saw a link between plastics and global warming? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, sir, and, uh, sir uh, when the drug package uh, and uh, covers, plastic covers we use, uh, yeah. that topic and the global warming, when no, cow, no coal and uh, nothing is found uh, anywhere in the India or other countries, how will be the situation in the country? I just uh, got in my mind. When there is no coal, you're saying? Yes, sir. No energy like coal is not found in the mine and not anywhere. Yeah. But why do you think there will be no energy? Uh, uh, I, um, sir, the uh, India and other countries in countries use more coal as their energy. Yeah. So when there is there is no coal, what is the situation in India? I just I that, that just came to my mind. Okay. So so let's say hypothetically there will be no coal in India, then so what do you think will happen next? It's not that we will all stop living, right? We all need electricity. There was no coal usage, so we will light up uh, old lamps and all. It will be, we are going to back, I think. Going back in time, okay. So, what would you light your lamp with? With uh, kerosene and all. We use kerosene. And, and where does wood, kerosene wood come wood. from? Uh, mining. Ah, so, this is the whole scientific process, right? So, we can systematically try to look at what you're saying. And we can say maybe that is a part of the whole oil extraction process, right? So these yes, are sir. fuels which we use. And I think we all sort of have a sense that the uh, whole sort of way in which petroleum and associated products are being used are contributing to the global warming story. And uh, why are we using it? Because there's a lot of it available. And... It is now economically viable for countries to use that for their purposes, for your individual houses, for industry, and for transport, and all of those things. But what do we have which will not run out, Dhruva, as an energy source? The sunlight. Uh, sunlight. So there we go. And that is a, what sort of uh, energy? Renewable, right? Yes, sir. So that means it is going to you have the capability of it being around and use it and reuse it and so on and so forth, right? So, of course, what you've mentioned is a wonderful sort of thought, which is saying that we should use renewable sources of energy if we want to try to make a difference. So what can you do, Dhruva, and other students to tell I mean, the community? Plastic. So plastics I mean, is one thing, but that is more of an environmental pollution type of issue that you're talking about. Of course, there is a slight link. Of course, there is. But in terms of if you're looking at the energy story, uh, what do you think is powering your school electricity-wise? Uh, uh, um, on. Probably, yeah. Do you think you could have a discussion in your classroom when you go next to say, is it feasible? Can we do a simple project to say, should our school have some solar panel? Yes, sir. Okay, so again, you should come up with your own thoughts. Very nice. 
Uh, and I'll, to... I'll probably also chip in here, uh, yeah. given that Dhruva finds the problem of plastic also, I mean, she feels for the problem. And yeah. plastic production, of course, also, I mean, plastic itself as a pollutant is one thing, and plastic production itself also gives rise to CO2. So can, can we also start rethinking the ways we package things? So, for example, in, in our lifestyle session, we did talk about opting for more natural materials to, for textile. Similarly, can we think of more natural materials for packaging so that we use and produce less of plastic? Yes, very nice uh, point, certainly. All right, uh, Rahul, so because we are running yeah. out of time, uh, maybe yeah. we so quickly just, show quickly, the yeah. resources. Yeah, I think what I'll do is I'd like to share the Tropixu website to begin with. Sure. And maybe just show students what you could look at for, uh, you know, just to get started. So uh, I think if as you all are, you know, sort of starting to think about your projects itself, uh, you know, where do you go to look at climate change educational resources or resources that you could base your projects on, right? And so the website that, uh, you know, I'm showing here is something that uh, I've helped put together, uh, which is called Drop Iksu. And this is basically educational resources that you can use to understand climate change, but from a lot of different perspectives itself, okay? Uh, so it's called, it, the website is dropixu.org. Okay? Now here, there are many resources which are listed that you all could take a look at. And if you go to this section, which is called teaching tools, you all will see that uh, there are a number of educational resources or other resources that you could look at based on discipline. Suppose you're just interested in climate change from, you know, the perspective of, let's say, chemistry or environmental sciences or geography, you could do it. But also you could look at it from on the basis of what type of tool is, is, is available. So let's say, you know, it's more interesting to you to do some hands-on activity. You could go to type of tool and then you could look at a classroom or a lab activity. Or if some of you want to play a game, you could go to the games tab or if some of you want to play around with let's say a model or a simulator you could go to that tab or you know, if you just want to watch a video to learn things you could so if i just go to let's say the games tab out here uh, you'll notice that there are about six seven games right now so this one and i think uh, you know uh, the question which uh, dhruva was asking, right, was on energy, right? Now, this is a game that you can play to look at what might be different scenarios uh, and demands and how much, uh, based on the energy usage of the planet, the population of the planet, and what sort of, uh, uh, you know, carbon emission there would be accordingly, right? So this is something you could play with, understand it, and try to see can you adapt it to your setting, right? You could make it to a smaller scale and then, you know, you're getting the basic idea from the game and you could try to make a smaller game, maybe even a board game about energy sources that, you know, you use or your family uses or your school uses, right? This one is one on climate change and human health. And now, so this actually talks about, you know, what is going to happen to human health and how do you prevent spread of disease? Now, this is something we are all learning about due to, during this pandemic. So something like this will be quite interesting. For you. A game like this one allows you to actually become the boss of the city. And you can design your own city where the effects of climate change would not be very, very pronounced or things like that. Right? So do go ahead. There's one called NASA Climate Kids. Uh, you know, when you go and click on one, it tells you about, uh, you know, all about these tools. And then, of course, you can go and click on this. This I'm going to just show you a snapshot. You see there are about six games out here. 
and somebody mentioned coral bleaching. There's a game on coral bleaching here. This is a game on different greenhouse gases, right? This is a game on just sort of understanding recycling and so on and so forth. Okay, so something like this could be useful to you all. Uh, you could also, you know, look at uh, particular activities that you could do. So uh, over time, you might have heard few things uh, about, you know, what are the impacts of climate change or so. And these are all lab activities. Somebody mentioned coral bleaching again. And this one is talking about how the oceans are getting acidic, right? So have you all learned about pH scale in school already? Acids and bases? Yes, Anyone? No. Right? So uh, this particular lab activity allows you to look at the pH of ocean and seawater and to understand how if the pH increases, what is going to happen to the marine life here? And this is looking and saying that, you know, the shells of various marine organisms, as time progresses, start to decay away or are no longer as strong, right? So something like this you could do in your classroom, correct? What could you do? You could take, uh, you know, shells and put it in water where the pH is of a particular number. You could make it more acidic and then you could start to see how those shells are in the changing over time as well, right? There are other things which are interesting uh, from various perspectives. So some of them uh, are of different levels. What you can do is you can choose things uh, according to your school level or uh, and some are of college level, but you could essentially use things which are of school level. Uh, and, and, and some of these are very nice, again, to understand things and to give you ideas about what is it that you can actually think about in terms of your projects itself? So please go ahead and see this, right? So this is, you know, there are different tools. We are calling it teaching tools, but they're also learning tools. So you can do it according to climate topic. Suppose you're interested in how health is changing, or you can actually go ahead and also look at uh, something in a little more detail. And I'll send you things such as <clears throat> where can you find resources to find temperature data in India or rainfall data in India and so on and so forth. The other thing to look at here is something called other similar resources. And of multiple climate change related resources all listed in one place, right? So there are, if somebody is interested in poetry, carbon poetry, go ahead and see this one where Hollywood celebrities are reading poems about climate change. If you want to know about the history of climate science itself, go to this first one where it's written in a very easy to understand fashion about how scientists discovered climate science and you know how things have moved on further and beyond that. Right. So if somebody is interested to see where can I get data, climate watch data is there for understanding what is happening in different cities, right? So there are plenty of these uh, things around here. You could look at them. They are from all over the world. And uh, a number of them would be really, really useful for you all to get ideas about. This one is another one I'd like to point your attention to, which is called the King Center for Visualization of Science. This is in from Canada. And each one of these things, if you can see, are different small lessons. And they are all done with visualizations where you can see things changing. You can play around with different factors and you will see how, uh, you know, your, uh, the role of greenhouse gases and so on and so forth. Many, many lovely lessons are essentially out here, right? So I think very briefly, this is uh, something you could get started with. And we'll, of course, send you a more uh, broad link uh, and, and links of different tools, which are resources, which might capture your attention. So this is just called tropixu.org, but good enough to get started.
All right. So one of the resources that really caught my attention was the one which is called Feminists uh, Climate Change Solutions. Yeah. And uh, that caught my attention because probably one of my objectives and dreams is that over years through our engagement with school teams and school students like you all, we can come up with the Indian climate change solutions. And you all will become the voices for uh, those solutions. Indeed. So uh, that's it for today. And uh, thank you very, very much, Sudhira and Rahul, for being there and uh, empowering and handholding our participants in the Climate Change Challenge. And uh, on behalf of CCMP, I thank you all for being here. And I'm really hoping for very exciting entries to come up in the Climate Change Challenge. Uh, we will meet again in two weeks uh, on 14th or 13th of November. We still have to decide the date uh, because I realized 14th is Diwali. Uh, but we will meet again in two weeks to, uh, that will be a final session and we will be discussing citizen science. So Dheera has already alluded to some of the key aspects of what citizen science mean, means and you will all get to meet people who are leading such initiatives and the idea is that it also inspires you to think of what are the new initiatives that citizen science can uh, look into in India in your own surroundings. Um, and my request is that the climate change challenge is open for two months it is open till 13th of uh, December. So do not make haste of just putting in something. Take time. We are doing all these expert sessions for you to come up with solid ideas that go in there. And, and uh, we are doing that because we don't want to do it just like another competition where you participate and you get a participation certificate or even a prize. We are, we are doing this with a longer term objective where we really expect that you guys and girls will get invested in the cause of climate crisis and become longer term climate warriors. So that's going to take patience and a lot more investment. And that's the kind of excitement we want to look in all of your entries as well. So, so do take advantage of all the experts that we have built in these last two months and build lovely entries. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank Good luck, you. everyone. Thank you, sir.